Hey guys, how are you? Welcome back to my garden channel. It is quite a cold and gusty winter's day outside today, which makes it just the perfect day to share a follow-up video on my previous one with you, where I already announced that I want to give you a glance at some of the seeds that I want to grow this year, and also give you a little bit of a sneak peek into my garden book. This is something that I do every single year, and it is really interesting, especially when you're starting a new area and you're planning things out. Before that happens, I just really want to give you a quick idea of just a couple of the seeds that I'm going to grow because this is my seed box and it's pretty full and I still have a couple of more upstairs where I just need to go through them because when you have seeds, there are two things that are always quite good. Number one is always have a good storage system and this is what I do here is I put them in a nice wooden box so I can always carry them around wherever I need them and it has two compartments. So one is only for my flowers and the second one is only for my vegetables before like this is everything new so before I put all the new ones and I've taken all the old ones out so they are kind of like lying upstairs in my room at the moment and I just need to go through them because my rule is when seeds are older than two years definitely older than three years I'm going to chuck them out because the older the seeds are the less good is a germination rate and it's kind of a waste of space, especially if you start a lot of them off indoors on your windowsill. You really want to make sure that a lot of them are going to come to life and germinate really well. If you don't want to throw them away and if you have plenty of space, you can obviously still do direct sowing outside and just fingers crossed that something is going to come up. But I hardly ever do it because by the time that you might do outdoor sowing, I have so many of my seedlings, I need to take care of so many of those that I kind of forget about the outdoor direct sowing process. So this is just one of those things that I always do. Then what I have is quite interesting and some really beautiful, nice things. A lot of these plants will grow onto the slope and into the new area just down by the slope that I call no man's land because this is like my fun garden. I do have a couple of perennials and grasses there and I want to incorporate even more grasses there. But by using a lot of different annuals and maybe biannuals, you can always play with new color palettes and new ideas. And this is what really excites me. Well, here in the upper garden is more like a big perennial garden with grasses, with a couple of shrubs and trees, obviously the two big walnut trees. Then I only have a couple of areas that I dedicate to annuals, but not nearly as big space as it is on the slope. So whenever I order seeds, I have my go-to online shops. And also like garden centers, obviously, where at one point I'm just stepping away from the seed section in the garden center not to go completely bonkers. But when you go through the online shops, there's always this moment of like, oh, this is nice and that is nice. And then your wish list and shopping basket is really big and you need to go through and see, do you really need all of those? But then there are those when the seed packages arrives and you're really excited, you go, they're beautiful, but... I completely forgot that I ordered them. And this is definitely the first one I'm gonna show you. It's a prairie mallow. I hope you get to see it because the images when you order online are sometimes really small, unfortunately. They are pink, they're mallow flowers. So on these spikes, which is really wonderful, but I don't really have a lot of pink in the garden. So I was like, hmm, what was I thinking? Probably it is gonna go into no man's land. I suppose there are not a lot of seeds in here anyways, 40 in total. So I feel that this was one of my Let's see and try it out plants, how I'm going to like it and how the germination will be. I never grew mellow ever before in my life. So this is going to be a first. This is a perennial. I also have annual mellows where I knew that I'm going to do them because they kind of remind me a lot of hibiscus. And last year I planted this red hibiscus from Proven Winners that I absolutely love. And fingers crossed it's going to come through winter and come back again. But sometimes it's funny when you order something, the seeds arrive and you're like, completely forgot about this. So this definitely falls into this category here. The next one that excited me, I hope I pronounce it right, Nicandra Blue. This is how it is. If you're intrigued, always take a screenshot, obviously, at this moment, or just pause the video and you can write it down. I ordered this mainly for the vegetable garden. It has beautiful flowers, kind of just like nice sky blue violet flowers. But what it does is when you underplant it, 
with your tomatoes or paprikas or uh, what was it, cucumbers, then you won't have a problem with white fly because white fly does not like this plant apparently. So this is just a natural way on how to get these nasty little white flies away from your vegetable garden and definitely always better than spraying. So when I came across this one, I was like, oh, I'm gonna try it, 150 seeds in here. So this is gonna be enough of the vegetable garden for this and next year for sure. Then red tobacco, this is going to be a rather small plant. Does it have a size? Um, no, it doesn't. But it's, I had it last year from the garden center and they were quite pricey to be honest. They were not cheap and this little pack had 700 seeds inside. It's not expensive. They are scented, which is wonderful. And I had them in some pots and I thought that they were just wonderful because they are scented. And the scent mainly released throughout the evening hours. So when you're sitting on your bench in the evening and you have pots with tobacco next to it, also like the white towering one, you have a really kind of sweet perfume, so wonderful. So I thought, oh, they are great, mainly for my pot garden arrangements. Next. I love Digitalis. So far, I always had the white ones. Sometimes they don't always come true in white. Sometimes there are sneaky pink ones in there. So it is, but you can always tell with a rosette though, when they start forming the first leaves, if they're gonna come true pure white or more pinkish, because the pinkish ones, the first leaves, they will have a tint of pink in there. But down for the slope, I wanna grow two different kind of digitalis. So the second one package does not have a photo, so it makes no sense to show you. This is Summer King. Thompson and Morgan see one of my favorite because they're kind of like absolutely soundproof to germinate. They're perfect, they will always work. Um, this is a very interesting color, which is sometimes hard to describe. It has tints of like green, chartreuse, kind of like burnt colors, a little blush inside, which is really wonderful. And the second one is a brown one, which rather small flowers. The King series always have big flowers and quite towering heights, like 60 to 70 centimeters, which is a good height, I think. And that is always interesting just for the architectural value that they bring, because you have these like flower spikes that shoot up a plant in. Really nice in between like shrubs, very great for semi-shade or partly shade in your garden, but they are biennials. And that simply means in the first year, these are going to form just a rosette of leaves. And those leaves, they're quite big sometimes. They're really just like trying to suppress everything that can kind of like interfere from the side. So all the weeds and everything, they just try to keep it low and down. And then the next year, then this really nice flower spike is gonna appear from the middle of that rosette absolutely beautiful and then it's worth collecting seed because once they're flowered that's it and then the next year nothing is going to come back again so this is really interesting about the life cycle of any kind of biennials if you want to grow them in your own garden then uh snapdragon i love snapdragons you might remember from last year i had like red ones mini cherry cola i think from thompson and morgan Artemis is another one, a red one that I really enjoy every single year. And this year I'm gonna go in a different direction. It's climbing. Climbing snapdragons. I've never seen them, I think. I've never grown them, certainly. And I thought they might be nice maybe as underplanting. Um, facing the sun side, so west or south, because they require sun under my hazels, because I cut back the hazels, but then they come always with these nice new fresh shoots. And um, I think it would be just a perfect frame for these to grow into. And the hazel shrubs, if you have like a red foliage hazel, you have the interest with the foliage, but if you have the green one, such as I do, the foliage interest is not stunning on hazel, let's just put it that way. I mean, it is what it is, so I love to put something underneath there that can climb inside the hazel, so you are rewarded with a couple of blooms. I'm not gonna do clematis because I always prune the hazel, so annuals are perfect for that. Maybe some of these are also gonna go next to my dad hedge so they can tumble over there, so I'm really excited to try these out. Fingers crossed gonna work. The next one, this is something that I've never seen, I never heard of, uh, of. I just discovered it in the online shop. I hope I'm going to pronounce it right. This is how they look, Mirabelli's Yalpa. I'm gonna turn the seed pack, there is the name, but it is really about the color. Isn't that kind of special? It sits in this world that I really love on seeds. It's like peachy and then the center is, pinkish it has really nice lush green foliage there was something quite tropical about it so i thought that they might work really wonderful on the slope but when i do my planting scheme for the slope and i'm going to show you in a second i haven't planned them in yet because i did that two years ago and then i was heavily relying on a plant that i've never grown before and i was kind of disappointed with it and then i really had a gap 
that I needed to fill with something else. So when I do my planning, I always plan with those plants where I know they're going to come, they're reliable. And then if I see with the seedlings already, I'm potting them on that they're really promising and they look bushy and nice and vigorous, then I might replace something here in my planting scheme with these. So this is something how I always plan it out. For example, I had annual phlox and that was the first year, two years ago, that I ever grew. They were great for cut flowers. They were really pretty and dainty, but the growing habit is kind of just like, kind of like tumbling a little bit. They're not like the most glorious in a border. They're nice for an underplanting, but I planned half a square meter only with annual phlox, and there was not a cute half a square meter. So I definitely learned my lesson. So when I plan something, I plan with a reliable first, what I know is gonna work. And then when I see the seedlings and that they grow really nice and wonderful, then I might replace it. So I'm really excited about these. And then obviously, which garden I can resist but growing cosmos because well, they're super easy to grow. And I think that they will fit just perfectly. This is apricotta. I saw them online on Instagram. Really nice, big blooms, peach, very bushy and robust plants in itself. They don't grow super high. The height is like 80 centimeters, but there is more than enough. And if you're good with your dead heading game, then they will flower for ages, all the way into late September eventually even. Uh, last year I had apricot lemonade. They were, well, lemonade. They were a little more lemon lemonade than apricot, I have to say. They were really cute, and if you have a light yellow in your garden, they might be perfect, but I'll focus more on peach. So I tried these, and my red ones last year, they were, I don't want to say disaster, because that always sounds a little too dramatic, maybe, but Rubenza was a disaster. They looked really, like, like nothing almost, really twiggy and... I was heavily underwhelmed. They were self-seeding, which really surprised me. And then I had the ones that I bought in the garden center where I forgot the name now. They were nice, but then they fizzled out really soon as well. So this year I'm like, if I feel like having some red ones, I might buy maybe two, three in the garden center, but I'm really going to rely on apricotta this year. Vegetable garden, this is going to be exciting because I have all this brand new area that I just showed you and I need to fill it obviously, but also the upper garden. One thing that I learned from last year is like growing salad is super easy, but a lot of this salad looks nice and tastes like nothing. So <laughs> there's like picking salad and I'm gonna do a couple of it because it's nice filling material, but it was so bland, there's zero taste in it. So I did some research on like what salad is nice and gives you flavor. And is this kind of trending, I think, salad from Japan, Mitsuna. I'm gonna grow Mitsuna purple because it is kind of supposed to taste a little mustardy and a little spicy and it has a quite distinct nice flavor apparently so I'm really excited about it. 100 seeds so I think I'm going to have a lot of meat sooner hopefully this is going to go in a raised bed. Then basil I'm definitely going to grow kind of like the standard nice green basil. This is Genova basil so there's not even a real name to it but then I'm also going to grow Thai basil, Siam Queen. It has this kind of distinct anise kind of flavor and it works so well if you like to do spring rolls in summer because I saw not, when it's hot outside, spring rolls um, are just really lovely. Not the fried ones like the Vietnamese, Vietnamese ones, they're called summer rolls, not spring rolls even. Um, with a rice paper and then you put like some nice veggies inside and I think Thai basil is a must and I can never buy it here. So I'm like, you know what, I'm gonna just grow by my own now. Then I'm gonna grow something which is typical for Poland, which um, I knew already from the north of Germany, but it's not so popular, it's sorrel. Here they make soup out of it, really wonderful. The photos are not the best and you're really poor, unfortunately. I hope you get to see at least a little bit. The sorrel has dark green leaves with red veins in it and it is a perennial, so it's gonna come back every single year. So I have a recipe, so I'm gonna make some sorrel soup on my own this summer, hopefully. And then I grow a lot, a lot of amaranth. You, might remember from last year and I'm still gonna do so. I'm not gonna show you all those seeds. I'm gonna have like my red amaranth with red foliage, red flowers. I'm gonna have coral fountain. I'm gonna have hot biscuit, which is what the name says, hot biscuit is really looking like a biscuit. It's kind of like brownish cinnamon color, really lovely for autumn and it worked really well next to like nice glowing orange dahlia. So I'm kind of trying to recreate that. And amaranth always has an amazing texture. But last year, quite a lot of you from the US commented and told me that you actually grow amaranth in your vegetable garden for the leaves and you prepare it like spinach. So 
here I go, I found some seeds, I ordered them, I'm really excited about that, so they will go into my vegetable garden, and then I'm going to tell you how they taste. Never tried it, it's, it's really a, not a thing in Europe at all, never seen of it, never heard of it, so I'm really intrigued about that. Then, well, there was an impulse yesterday in the hardware store, because they just put all the new seeds of the season in there. Um, cabbage. I had some cabbages this year and I was kind of successful with that I have to say. It was a lot easier to what I thought. I'm also going to do like broccoli and cauliflower again. White cauliflower was really good. Purple was okay and yellow and green just did not exist. I mean I don't know what happened to those seedlings but there was nothing. But I'm going to do pointed cabbage this year and not a green one but a purple one. Dark purple. Have you ever seen that? I mean, I've never seen that in reality, like on a market stand or in a garden or anywhere. I'm like, oh, this is going to be very intriguing. Pointed cabbage is one of those cabbages that I always forget about, even though it's lovely because it boils a lot faster than the white one or the red one. And it just has a really wonderful flavor to it. So I'm kind of excited about this new experiment. Then, okay, celery. Last year, this was my total fallout. I tried it last year. This year, I did a research and this is apparently a reliable variety Victoria F1. Um, can somebody please tell me what I might have done wrong with celery last year because I grew it on the windowsill, germination took forever and it was poor. I think out of maybe, I don't know, 50, not 50, but probably 25 seeds that I sowed, I think maybe five came up, three kind of made it through potting up and then I put them into the ground and they just fizzled out. It was like, they have just haven't made it at all and I'm not really sure what the big, big problem was. So out of my vegetables, I mean, I had like two small onions and stuff like that. But in general, it was a good year. But celery was a total disaster. And if anybody has good advice on what I might have done wrong with those, please share it with me because I'd be very happy. I love celery and I really want to grow it in my garden. Last two before I show you my little garden bird. Pumpkins, I love pumpkins. Pumpkins, potatoes and beans, I could be a farmer for those because those are the things that I can always grow. I'm always successful with these. With pumpkins, I always grow Hokkaido and this year again because they're so darn easy. You don't need to do a thing. They always have a lot of fruit also here at the south coast of the Baltic Sea, very reliable. And you can prepare them so easily because the rind is edible. And then, this is a new one I've never grown before, mashed potato, white pumpkins. Aren't they pretty? I thought that they were spectacular. They're edible and they're obviously great for decorating. So I can't wait for all of these wonderful things. They will go back into my little box now. And now I want to open my book and just share with you just quickly how my new vegetable garden is going to look. And also just to give you a glance on how I plan things out on the slope, mainly for me for a color one. It looks a little bonkers, prepare yourself, but it just really helps me. Maybe it is a good idea for you as well and if you start a new area on how to plan it out. I'm not sure if I've ever really shown you the garden journey or garden book that I do, but this is pretty much how it looks on the inside. So this is the new herbaceous border that I planted with you last year. So starting off by taking out the turf and putting stone edges and planting everything and then my plant list and then I also make some notes with them. What else do I have in here? This was like the new perennial border. Try to find, okay, sometimes I also like to sketch some of the flowers that really interest me and intrigue me. It also sometimes helps to just like to understand almost like the anatomy of a bloom. But then I have these areas that are changing every single year, so I need to open it now. Like the slope and my new vegetable garden. So this is for me just a wonderful way on how to visualize it but also it is a great opportunity sometimes to go back in time because year after year when you do the plan you can really go back in time and see how your taste might have changed, um, if things worked out the way and how you wanted them to work out if you make notes to it. So this is always really intriguing. So this is pretty much the entire slope. If I come in with my finger now this is how we enter it from the garden. So there's a pear tree. And then here is a vegetable garden, the three terraces with the three raised beds. This is where I grew most of my vegetables, pumpkins. This here will be potatoes and pumpkins. And then the new vegetable garden, which I've mapped out over here. So I'm gonna show you in a moment. Then kind of like what my first ideas for no man's land are still there. A lot of stuff like blackberries that need to come out. I'm not sure when I'm in the mood for that. And then this looks totally bonkers. This is a slope. Everything is colored in, which also makes it look a little wild at times. And not everything is going to come to bloom at the same time. But it really helps me to visualize because the upper garden, which is here, 
I focus on color combinations of red, dark red, crimson and purple and violet. So going onto the slope, I continue with the same rhythm of color, a little bit of pink here and there. And then as we go further down, the blue is a constant that stays throughout the entire garden because it's just a wonderful color, but then it changes. I'm still gonna have like red from the Panacetum vertigo so i'm going to have like some big blobs of it across the slope this year and then the red will be substituted the red blooms by peach and tones of orange as we go down here so there is a nice like an ombre effect of color on the slope and doing this really helps me when it comes to the planting to see where do I want to plant what? And that I'm not going to have like all the orange plants only on one side and all the blue on the other side so that there is a nice mixture of color, of texture, of height. Where do the grasses go? Do I have annual grass? Do I have perennial grasses? And it just really helps me, especially planting up a bigger area as the slope. Then the new vegetable garden. And this is interesting because I just toured you around in this area. I sketched it on scale which rarely happens for me, but this is obviously a good thing because now I could really measure everything and see how much room do I actually have. So I definitely have space for five raised beds. This is how I wanna lay them out. On the right, there is a row of espalier. And then here, the middle raised bed, this is where I can put maybe some cucumbers in the front, some dahlias in the back, dahlia danique, danique, I'm not sure how to pronounce it right. I just ordered them. Very interesting, kind of a red orangey tone, very zingy. So I thought, oh, they scream summer. Then here in the middle, there is the path that is gonna go into no man's land. Here this is where the dead hatch is and where I'm gonna grow some runner beans and some potatoes. And then just across from it, there will be some more dahlias, fairway. They were like these really big ones. I thought maybe really nice for cut flowers. I ordered five of them. My cold frames in the back, there will be gooseberries. And then on the right, a nice row of blueberries where I could use all of my nice leaf compost that I made. So this really helped me to visualize and just to plan better. Cause also now in the raised beds, I can write down what I wanna put eventually in these raised beds. So I know when it's time to plant him, that not everything is gonna go crazy and bonkers. So I also might put the, things that grow higher or taller here towards the back. And then the things that stay smaller go here because this is southwest facing in that corner basically. So I don't want that anything that grows tall blocks the sun and no sun is gonna to go to the back here. So whatever will be the tallest is gonna go into these two raised beds here. So doing this always helps me a lot trying to visualize and it is so much fun, especially in winter time because it helps you until you can really go out again and start with real gardening and until the new garden year starts again. That's it for today's video from my cozy home. At least for me, it is kind of cozy because of fireplaces in my back, which made it really nice to do this video like this, sitting on the floor. Alfie's also with me. Come on, Alfie. Do you want to say hello to everybody? Everybody's always asking on Instagram, how is Alfie? Sometimes I'm just like, it's Alfie's garden, actually. Here she is. Oh. Do you want to go out in a second? Even though it's very windy, I think you want to. So I think Alfie and I are still going to throw ourselves out into the garden and try to find something, at least where I'm a little bit sheltered and protected because the wind is a thing today. And I hope that I can show the garden to you very soon again, even though I will at one point do more indoor videos, especially when it comes to sowing those seeds. So I hope that today's video was interesting for you and maybe also inspirational. Like if you wanna start doing a garden journal or maybe some of those seeds that I've shown to you, maybe they are interesting for you as well. So all I can say now is thank you so much for watching today's video. Thank you if you decide to subscribe to my channel, if you give me a thumbs up, it's very kind of you and I'd really love to welcome you in one of my future videos very soon again. Take care guys. Bye.